So continuing um, this discussion with Esther Montmanet about conscious parenting, we were in the situation of imagining that, you know, the child, he or her has come to breakfast and maybe there's, they're, they're not feeling so good today and they don't want to eat what's for breakfast. And we had a discussion about what would happen if that, you know, being with them, being with whatever is upset, even if that escalates. And then we wanted to talk a little bit now, Esther, about about also setting up the positive environment. So there was kind of how do we deal with challenge or how do we deal with upset? Um, and this kind of, again, walking this, maybe you could say the middle way where there's still like firmness, there's still a, there's still a boundaries, but with it comes always from love and compassion and always the, re, the real aim is to discover and be with, uh, with love, with the, the suffering, so it can be kind of transformed or processed. Um, and therefore, then they can kind of come back because the natural instinct of the child is to kind of cooperate when they're well. So do you want to say a little bit about how we kind of cultivate they will set up the positive environment, the other structures of, of life with the child that supports that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's exactly like that. When the, the, the basic thing is that we know that the child is a good person, it's a great person. And if he is behaving in a way that it's annoying, it's because he is suffering in that moment. It's not his fault. It's like there are things in him which are difficult for him to to and he's expressing them in the way he feels them in a bad way so this is a basic thing this trust that at the end the child is good and if the child is feeling well is going to act in a way that it's harmonious and then the other important thing is that i do create an environment where the breakfast is ready where i am present when i give more important to the child than to the fact that he has to eat this or that. So I, my responsibility is that the breakfast is ready, that there is a healthy breakfast with a few things so he can choose. It's not only one thing, but I do not impose him whether he has to eat or not. I do protect him from throwing away the, the food on the floor if he's angry or nervous or he has some other kind of negativity but I don't do it by pushing him or punishing him or touching him. So this is the middle way. Like I do prepare the breakfast, and but I do not say you have to eat now this or that. Even he can choose not to eat. But it's true that there are some boundaries. Like if a child doesn't want to eat, for example, and then uh, after two hours tells me, and now I want an ice cream. But then at dinner time, he doesn't, at lunch time, he doesn't want to eat lunch. But then I, now I want to cross on with chocolate. So I do put some boundaries. I say, no, now I'm not going to give you a cross on of chocolate. If you want, there is some fruit, there is some nuts. And then in half an hour or in one hour, I'm going to prepare the dinner for everyone or the lunch for everyone, and you will be able to eat. So if he's really hungry, he can eat a piece of fruit and some nuts. This is not going to take away his hunger. And then when it's time for food, I still, once again, I prepare the meal with love. Maybe they help me if they're old enough. And then they can choose how much they want to eat and what do they want to eat. So this is one of the, the basic kind of middle ways. I do not push you. I respect that you may eat or not. I respect how much you want to eat, what, how much you want to eat, the amount you want to eat. For example, if you put in your plate only like uh, two spoons uh, of rice and you eat that and that's enough. But what I do not do, for example, is like if you put a whole plate full of rice and then you don't want it, I'm gonna say, okay, what do we do with this rice now? And we, we won't throw it into the rubbish. If he says, I wanna throw it into the, into the rubbish, I will say, no, I do not agree in that. We need to find another solution. And then I may say to him like, tomorrow we will take care that when you put rice, you put less. So I don't mind how much rice you put in your plate as long as you eat it. Or also to take care of how much rice there is for everyone. I'm not gonna adoctrinate him. You should look, uh, you have two brothers and one sister and you should put only this amount of rice. I will only say today we can eat like, uh, for example, imagine there are biscuits, like uh, three or four biscuits each, no more. 
I may say this, but I'm not going to doctrinate him as you should be more generous, you should think about others, because this is like telling him the truth is that you're not generous, that you need to learn that. So th there is many middle ways that you are kind of the adult that protects the environment so it's uh, a safe environment for everyone. But at the same time, you give a space for everyone to be exactly how they are. You don't push them. So let's just highlight that point. And I don't know, it has about food it has a lot of resonance for me because I remember at least being at school and eat, uh, you know, and being forced to eat food that I didn't want. You know, I didn't have a choice to take what I wanted. And um, I also even remember my parents who were very wonderful and loving in many ways but being like i remember this one battle of wills where i had to sit there all afternoon to eat the food or whatever which i think is a common uh parenting aspect for us some at some times whether a frustration i made all this nice food why are you know you, know, you liked it last time or something and so let me just distill this so the key point is that we don't ever really force the child to eat food that they, they even if they don't want to eat anything that that's okay what may be happening is though we don't say if someone's eating nothing at lunch and then two hours later they want a croissant with chocolate we're not like oh yes have that we might be like okay you can have like a snack so you know like you can have a piece an apple or a piece of nuts and then we're going to eat later so first of all that's one point and then you're saying in terms of taking um the the basically the point would be that if a child takes a lot of food, for example, we may not meet force that we don't, we definitely don't say, okay, you've now got to eat all your food, you took it. However, we don't just also step over that they took way, maybe too much food for them to eat. So we might say, okay, what's going to happen now? You know, not that maybe you're going to eat it, but that you're going to, um, you know, we're going to, how are we going to look after it for tomorrow? Or at least raising this aspect for them that they have taken more. And I also remember that your coaching also to me was, if a child takes food, for example, a lot of food and doesn't eat and then wants something else, we might then say no. We might at that point say, you took this food. You're not you're not taking loads of rice and then you want uh, loads of pa pasta as well. Like if if you haven't finished your rice, if if I gave him the rice, then he has that choice because I kind of didn't give it to him with his. He wasn't necessarily choosing it. But if he took the rice, is that correct? That if, for example, he or she took the rice for themselves and they don't finish it, we might not let them have other things in that moment. Is, is that right? If, if there is also a flexibility, if the child, you see that he is already mature and that even he has a lot of rice, you see with experience that he can get more things and finish everything. Then I don't say anything. I only try to kind of help and facilitate him the awareness of how much he has and how much he can take. And I may say to him, I stop you for taking more. If I have experiences in the past, and we've already talked about this, maybe one day I say nothing and he puts a lot. And I think it's a lot. The child puts a lot and, and I think it's a lot. But then I see he is actually finishing it. So it's OK. It's no problem. But if it happens one time and maybe another time that the amount he serves himself or herself, is, it's a lot more than can, that he or she can actually take. Then I say very, very lovingly, like, what, what are we going to do with it? If it's old enough to take decisions. Uh, if, and, and sometimes it's a bit easier to just say, okay, give it to me. I eat it, you know? I remember one time I did it in, in Ecuador when I was with Rebecca. And we were in this party with all the community. And, and my son, normally he eats everything. But that day we were so social with so many people. And he came with the plate. And he said, I don't want this anymore. And I said, okay, I'm going to eat it. I did it in front of Rebecca. And she said to me, you know what they say in Thailand? I think she had uh, some family in Thailand or, or in Thailand. And she said, they say that the parents that eat the leftovers of their child become their slavers. And from then on, I really put a lot of uh, attention on like, okay, so you serve all that and now you are not not hungry anymore what will you do and they give different answers some of them i can say i do not agree in this answer and some of them are okay sometimes they say okay i i, I want to keep it in the fridge and i will eat later or or maybe it's not so much and they want to give it to the dog and it's okay because it's not so much and you say okay for today is good but tomorrow uh you try to remember and if you don't remember maybe i will help you to remind that 
and bit by bit we learn to take uh, the amount we need but always not with the idea like oh i know it and you don't know it because i remember one time that i was around 17 and someone invited me to a self-service it was the first time i went to a place that i could take as much food as i wanted and i was already quite old enough to know the amount of food i need but i did it completely wrong because my eyes were like wow all this food so i started to serve myself and this has happened to me even being an adult sometimes so it's not like oh you should know this it's like yeah it's a difficult thing isn't it let's try tomorrow better so this is more the approach it's not so like punishing but it i must say that once again this is a path and the one that has more work is the adult because we do have very strong experiences with food we've been forced to eat or sometimes we have been transmitted from other generations the fear of dying from hunger and there are all this pressure like some grandmothers they keep telling us eat eat more and we have many many experiences with food and also it is really linked to emotional uh, difficulties sometimes we eat because we don't want to feel or oh, sometimes we don't eat because we cannot feel hunger because we have so many other worries so sometimes we are completely unbalanced and we don't eat what we would need to eat so when you see a child that is unbalanced instead of trying to focus too much on what he should eat how much he should eat is more to focus on what is in him that is not allowing him or her to feel hunger to feel the because the body is very wise and normally you want to eat what is good for you and what is healthy and what is balanced one day you want to eat salad another day you want to eat rice and i can see it with many examples with many children of all ages that when they are like with enough well-being inside they do choose really healthy food and very balanced diet and you don't need to tell them anything you don't need to give them lessons of uh, any kind of thing it's just natural. And when that is not there, when they only want sugar, pizza, uh, fried chips, or uh, milk, or things like bread, things like uh, very sugar things, is something in them. So instead of focusing only in the food, we should focus what is missing in their environment in our relation with them. So they, they are not really feeling safe, they're not really feeling uh, clean enough inside clean in a way of not having a lot of inner difficulties so they if they could if they could be like really in connection with themselves they would choose a regular food in a in a very natural rhythm with healthy food that would be natural and they would enjoy eating one thing i learned in india is that you don't need to force children to eat i'm not speaking about children who are dying of hunger just normal children from, from, from families in India. They were all eating and they were all enjoying food and nobody was trying to make children eat, like making an airplane and all these things so the, the child opens the mouth. It's like, they were all eating until the pot finishes and everyone eats really well, it's no problem. So here we do have a lot of problems that we should check what's going on. Why do we have all these problems with food? And so just to, yeah, to recap that, I think a little bit for myself and then maybe to come to an example. Again, this, there's this principle around maybe uh, the, the middle way and the, the, the kind of the, the balance. So again, you know, we're not, we're not knowing better. This is also an attempt for the child to give them autonomy, to give them the space to choose what they want to eat. So even again, you said you often have choice, they get to choose. And even when they take, we don't, for example, stop them. What I even got from you is, let's say we see a child taking a lot. We might not stop them, we, but we might say to them, oh, you're taking a lot there, you know, um, and not with maybe judgment or even I know better, but more like a lovingness, like that they are aware. And, and not again, that we also even give them the chance to maybe make them, if you like the mistake, if, if they do take a lot, we're like, oh, you took a lot today and you haven't finished it not like oh that's bad you must finish it now like i can remember at school being sent back to my table to finish what i taken but more like okay what are we going to do about it and even creating with them okay we might put it in the fridge or we might you know give it to the dog but we don't want to do that all the time 
Um, and this key point you also said, if we don't finish it for them, you know, is you, the joke Rebecca Wilds at you, if you'll become their slave, sort of, we want to develop their autonomy and capacity to make judgment for themselves, to assess for themselves. And in a way, also, finally, this key point, when there are issues around eating, because it's quite a basic thing, it's almost always related to something, what you say, cleanliness. So I just want to clarify that for listeners, what you don't, you don't mean literal, but this metaphorical, emotional cleanliness. When there's, when there's suffering there, when there's something that hasn't been processed, hasn't been dealt with, that may get in the way of them being able to be in tune with their own body wisdom about what to eat, how much to eat. Exactly. And, and, yeah, yeah. That, that, and I want to ask a question then. I did want to then ask, have you had ever done coaching? Because I just know, I even know people, friends of mine, and I can tell the mother, it's really understandable, or even me sometimes, you know, we worry, you know, is, is he eating enough or is she eating enough? There's, and that point about also we and the parents have a lot of anxiety or worry. Um, but have you ever dealt more even like with kids, you know, they haven't eaten for, you know, parents are really worried about them because they haven't eaten, you know, they're not eating enough for like many days or something or that they've got a concern and, and how you dealt with that. Like, because even in that, I think even the extreme, I don't want to say the extreme case, but the stronger case maybe illustrates even the milder case where many parents, I think, even when their child's eating okay, worry, you know, <laughs> you know, are they eating too much? Are they eating the right thing? Um, yeah. Do you have any experience of cases like that and how you would, how you would advise or support the parents in that situation? From the first commentary, I wanted to say that, uh, yeah. for example, uh, it, it's true that the right attitude for me is not to want him to learn straight away and do things straight away well and to give a space for for mistakes and for having his own rhythm and process of learning it's very important so this i really i saw it you got it really clear and then also the amount he he puts i would only put a limit if i see that he's taking from the communal plate a lot more than in proportion the others can get then i would say look uh, it's enough rice for now I wouldn't say him because the others also may want rice because for me this already is a line of a little bit of moralistic. Can you, say, can... can you say a bit more about that actually, that point? about? I remember this also being very striking in your coaching to me of not giving reasons so much. So for example, um, I even like, okay, it's time for the bath for my son. And you would be to me, you just say it's time for, I don't say, oh, you need to have a bath because you're dirty or you need to eat because it's important that you grow strong. Or, I, and that was very striking to me because most of the time I noticed that I was doing that. So could you actually say a bit more about that point? Like even there where you're stopping, let's say you're stopping a young child from taking more than is, you know, there's like five slices of cake and there are five people and they're about to take, you know, too much. You were you might stop them. You might say, "Okay, that's enough," and you wouldn't say, "Like, oh, that's that's too, you know why?" Can you tell you a bit more about that? Because I think that's actually very important and and, and, and unusual and intriguing. Yeah, the the strong point of this way of being with children is that we try to give them uh, the the um, the right conditions for him or her to develop their own uh, autonomy of of everything, of taking care of how much food they need, what food they need. If they can serve themselves, it's better than us serving them. So we put things in a way he can serve himself or herself. And also this of not giving reasons, it's a little bit so they can reach their own logic. Because for me, maybe like if you say to someone, no, I, if you say to a very young child, um, eat so, don't eat chocolate because if not, your teeth will fall, you know? <laughs> because the sugar is really bad for your teeth. Maybe this is your idea. We are not completely sure how is, he's going to get it. Maybe he thinks every time he eats a bit of chocolate, two, two teeth are going to fall. We don't understand very well how he's going to take it. And this is my world. Uh, some people is like, if you smoke a cigarette, you're going to get cancer. And then other people smoke cigarettes the whole life and they don't get cancer. Or you say a little child. Uh, stop doing that because you are annoying the neighbors, but actually maybe the neighbors are not even there. Or you say, I'm not going to give you the jar of honey because you may break it. 
you're too young, you're too weak. So you're all the time transmitting your ideas, which you think they are certain and they are your reality, but it's your reality. You don't have the big question of like, maybe it's not true. Maybe it's not true. Maybe I give him the jar of honey and he can actually take care of it and he's strong enough. Maybe he goes there to see the neighbor and the neighbor is really happy to receive a child in that very moment. And you have these ideas of not annoying, things are like this. So we try to give the child autonomy so he can get to that point where he can find his own reasons. And for example, in this case, if we are in the, in, it's a good, it's a good example, food, because we do it every day. Every day we eat maybe two times. So there's going to be some moment that maybe someone comes, another child from maybe a friend or something, and he takes all the butter. He didn't think of others needing butter, for example. And he likes butter a lot and he takes it all. And then the child gets really shocked. Oh, I also wanted butter, but now it's gone. And then I may say to him, yeah, it's true. You didn't like that at all, that he didn't think of you. You really didn't like it. No, because I also wanted. So now he has an experience without me giving reason, without me going too far. He is his own experience. And from that experience, he may bit by bit understand why sometimes I say to him, this is like three for each, especially when there are yummy things. Like you make, for example, little things like they are fried, uh, for example, fried aubergines or something that they really like it a lot. And then it's like, they would eat the whole plate when you make a Spanish omelet and they would eat half of it. But we are like six people. I remember one time that my daughter was really upset because I invited the neighbors to eat and there was a Spanish omelet because she knew she would have less. So next morning for breakfast, I cooked a Spanish omelet only for her. And she had a whole, and she still remembers after many, many years, she still remembers she had her own Spanish omelet. But of course, when the, the neighbors came, she had to... She had to share it whether she wanted or not. And I never said that's the reason why you do it. But as they grow and they have uh, experiences where sometimes they lose things or someone is not so taking care, then they, they get to understand by themselves, not because you kind of put it onto them. Wow. So I, th I want to really draw this point out just for myself and, and for people listening is this is a a really kind of deep teaching and again an example i got a lot for myself and it relates of course i just want to mention for those who are familiar let's say with buddhist teaching on signlessness and and many many uh wisdom traditions point about the degree to which um maybe we don't even experience reality we experience our conception of reality and our conception of reality is formed by the languaging and the concepts we got from elsewhere and as I caught myself with my own child in this experience after your coaching, Esther, around this, it's a quite an amazing experience as a parent because you do realize how often you give reasons for things and how the reasons are um, uh, not even, but the reasons have um, judgments that aren't just factual. You know, it, a lot of the time, I think the most subtle are, you know, that's not a nice thing to do. Um, you know, don't don't shout because that's rude. Or, you know, there's a lot of moral judging, which is, I think, what you also mentioned. There's obviously stuff that's more factual might even be like, I'm not giving, you know, things that you might think, oh, why does it matter? Like, I'm not giving you the glass and I'm not going to, rather than just saying, I'm not going to give you the glass right now. Like, oh, you're too small to carry it. That might, many people might think, oh, that's just descriptive. And in a way that's more descriptive, but I'll, once you start noticing this adding of the reasons, um, you, at least myself, I saw how much the reasons I was giving were kind of, um, first of all, not necessarily true. They were sort of my opinion, but also they had this moral quality, you, you know, like, don't do that. You should, or, you know, you should be a nice child. You should be a good child. This is what a good child is. And this is bad. And this great, you know, obviously in the true ultimate dimension of Buddhism and many other traditions, there is no good and bad, not because that they're denying any morality, but in the sense that they want us to see the degree to which we're trapped in concepts, particularly uh, those kind of concepts, um, yeah. which, which are clearly in some way invented, you know, 
Um, I don't think, um, I don't know, even the dog or the elephant or the certainly the ant has the good, good and bad. You know, there is and there isn't. There is just stuff. And I want to mention... Yeah. Dog, because uh, he can bite you. Or oh, don't touch the dog, the dog because it's dirty. Or oh, don't jump, don't go up there because you're gonna fall. Or oh, there are many, as you say, there are many reasons that come from a place of fear, a, pay, a place of judgment. And when you give the reason, you're already saying the child. You cannot get the reason by yourself. You, you need me to tell you because you don't know anything. I know the reasons, but you don't. So I tell you the reasons. So this is already a lack of trust. And as you say, it does put in a, in a pure mind already a lot of uh, ideas which, which maybe they are our ideas. For example, I love dogs. So when my child goes to a dog, I don't say he, these things to him or to her. Or I'm not afraid of the child climbing because I was a climber. But I may do other things. I try not to do it, but everyone tries to unconsciously pass their own their own ideas. And then another thing I want to say about this is that human beings, they do not come completely developed. They are born, but they're like still developing their brain from the from the moment they are born until they are 24 years old. There is a whole process of developing the brain. And the truth is that a very young child still has not yet developed his or her own capacity to reason. It's more like concrete. It's, it's developing more the part of uh, tasting, uh, uh, feeling things. It's more like empiric. And he needs to do well that until around six years old, bit by bit, he will start to develop. But what we try to do is three, four, five, six years old, we're already giving a lot of uh, our own reasoning when they are still not ready for that and it is like saying to someone who still cannot walk how to how to run or how to uh, move his legs in a way that he can do steps and in a sight of him it's like this is not respectful because he's or she is not yet ready for that we should try to be more in tune with uh, the nature of a child which is not like very logic is very imaginative like very like uh, mm, a lot more concrete so and you go to his level and you speak to him or to her in that level, like that would be more like you can do that, but he cannot do the, the other one. He, they only repeat because they see how important it is for us that he becomes or she becomes very reasonable. And we are like this in this culture and we force the process. And then it makes it a lot more difficult to create the possibility to a human being to really develop a true inner, singular, clear and original and new thinking you know he yeah. they only repeat they only repeat and we only repeat and we don't evolve when you don't do that you learn to speak in a complete different way and some people are a little bit weird in your sight because we don't realize but we're all the time speaking reasoning and giving our ideas and and it it all becomes and when we have a little chance a little chance to give a lesson to a child we just give a great lesson, especially if it's like really logic. We love it. We love it. We feel really like, wow, how much I know and how little he knows. And the child, even some children, they become really used and they really want it at the end. Even it's not really the best for their development. But it becomes like, a, for me, it's like a little, very subtle drug. You know, it's something that you have the tension of the adult very easy like that. So you mean this is why, you know, you mean the kind of like if a child gets a lot of like, why this, why that, asking for the reasons, that's actually a sign they've grown habituated because normally there's also this reward of, oh, you're a smart child if you understand the reasons. So you, what you mean is there's a way that our kind of, um, if I could say it for myself, I'm speaking, my addiction to to the mind and to the, the reasoning it, it kind of it, it you can kind of imprint that onto the child and they almost become like oh why this why that daddy which which when it comes from it what we're saying here and it's again it's subtle i want to emphasize i think of course what we're trying to also cultivate is a genuine and valuable curiosity about the world but there, there's a point you're trying to say where that will arise naturally 
And there's a point where it's more become because they're trying to please these these figures in their world. And that's when it's unhealthy, when it's like, oh, I've learned that that's what I should do. I just want to bring us back for one moment to another concrete example that's very relevant for any parent. And we're talking here about relatively young. Well, it still applies to all children, but maybe younger children. You know, I mean, my, my child is still under three. Let's say there's another area that I was very struck by. Let's say a child, let's say a child is playing outside or or any in general, or or they're walking on the road, like for the first like working on the pavement, you know, and maybe they're young, they're not good at walking and they fall over. How should we what is a conscious parenting approach to to that? Um what, what yeah how let's say a child falls over and they it, it let's just be clear they haven't maybe it's clear at that moment at least they haven't they've not really hurt themselves they haven't broken their arm they're not they maybe have you know, scraped their hand maybe maybe there's a little blood maybe there isn't even blood but they but they but obviously there may be something happened how do we how what because i think this is another area that illustrates this about both reasons and how we are with the child how would you suggest that one is you know, maybe a child, let's say between one and three, maybe even they're just starting to walk or things. So they fall over quite a bit, or even they're a bit later. How, how would you be with them? Would you suggest? So for me, that's a very clear approach is that I would go closer to the child and I would listen first before to speak. I would listen, not only the words, but also the, the body, because the children, the younger they are, the less they use the verbal expression to express their they're living but it's more with the body so i would check what's the face look how the face looks like how the body is is it rigid is it relaxed is it with pain is it uh, open and i would not really touch him or her yet i would be there kind of ready available to listen with my whole body to his or her own body and then uh, i wouldn't change the posture very fast like some people grabs the child and really puts him or her up very straight away and very fast. So I would give space and time so they can realize what's going on. Oh, I'm upside down. I'm in between these bushes, for example, if he has. I remember one time my child was going down with the bike and he fell in these bushes and he was completely upside down. So I just, I was there, I was quite impressed. I was thinking, wow, maybe he has really hurt himself a lot. But I give him the space that he can actually realize, oh, what happened? Oh, I'm upside down on my, all these bushes around me and I'm there for him, but I'm not trying to be the main character by asking things and doing many things, but giving space. And then he was like starting to move and complaining of something. And, and then I would say, "Do you mind? maybe I can take this plant away. Uh, kind of listen, what does he need? And giving a lot of the space so he can understand what happened by himself, not making too many questions and giving him the, the rhythm so he can take his own decisions and try to give the space so he can come out also by himself. And I'm there especially for the listening, for the, oh, this is painful. And maybe once he has moved and changed the position, and he, if he asks me something, I may do it, like pull the bike here. But always he has the, the, the first uh, kind of initiative. He has the idea, he tells me what he needs and I'm there to help, but like also giving a lot of space so he can do it himself. And then, if he needs to be in water with soap, so we clean the, the herd. And then maybe he says, no, I prefer to do it myself because he's afraid that I put too much water. So he does it himself. Sometimes it's dirty and he says, no, but I don't want to clean it. So this is the, I remember, like sometimes they, they, they hurt themselves not a lot, but they scream a lot. They cry a lot. And for you, it's not logic. It's like nothing happened. Why are you screaming so much? But this is not my approach. This is what we may think inside because of our transmission in the past. But in fact, what, uh, this is the, the path to, to see that is the old approach and that this is in me, but I want to do something new. So instead of questioning it and, and transmitting that, I would just listen. Okay, for me, it looks like nothing happened, but he's expressing a lot 
with his screaming. He's screaming like if he has been cut in a thousand pieces and he has hardly touched himself. This happened to me many times. And then with time, I realized that in those moments when he fell, uh, it was also moments that my child felt a lot and, and it was not so normal because he was quite good with his body. But all of a sudden he, he started to have these little accidents and screaming a lot. And then I realized that it had nothing to do with the bike or with the road. It had to do with me and his father splitting out and that he, he was going through a lot, but his way of cleaning was, he needed to have something. He could not just scream out of nowhere because he could not do that. And then what is difficult is that when a child starts screaming, after some time as a parent, I learned to listen. I learned to give a space to whatever he needs to express without judging, without saying, this is too much, this is too little, you should do this. No, I just listen. And he was like, wow. And then all of a sudden, the people around get really touched. People is not used to listen to children uh, crying and they get really like in touch with their own little child. And then they come, is everything okay? What is wrong with him? And they try to stop him. You're a boy, boys shouldn't scream, you know? And it's hard when they do it in places that is like public places because then you need to take care of your child. And more or less, you need to take care a little bit of other people, children. If not, they interfere in your own child. And sometimes it was quite strenuous for me because it's already like, I was already living my own pain, understanding that my child's suffering came a little bit from me and the father. So it was already quite hard for me to deal with my own suffering, the suffering of my child. And then these neighbors coming full of anxiety. And then I would say, yeah, I understand that for you it's very loud. Yeah, it's difficult to hear a child. So. But I would speak to them so they don't say things to my child to distract them or so. This is a, another example. Uh, I don't know if it actually answers your question. Yeah. Or it's how. amazing. I, I want to say things, so I just want to let you finish, but maybe I can come in. I mean, I think uh, this is just so, again, really uh, profound also. So again, just to draw out key points. The so one is there's this middle way of conscious parenting. So, you know, w- uh, one, one extreme, and I'm caricaturing it would be like the child just, you know, the moment they fall over, it's like, are you okay? Let me get you up. Let me do this and the, uh, that and the other. And at the other extreme is the child fall over it and it's hurt. And like, you're like, get up, you know, what's wrong with you? Be a man, be a woman, whatever, like stop crying. Um, and, and even in between that, there's an often noticeable in, and I've now noticed it in our culture, is an ability to be with the upset. So either on the one end, is like, are you okay? Let me fix it for you. Let me clean your hands. It's all okay. But the real also often desire is for the child to be kind of quiet and okay. And then the other extreme is actually similar. Like man up, women up, stop it, basically. And at the end, your point is that, again, we, we want to, at the really deep level, we are trying to be there with their suffering and that often it may not even be physical, that a moment of, uh, for small children, a physical hurt, particularly minor physical hurt we're talking about, their upset may not relate, that it may be a chance for them to be upset and to express emotion, or even as older children. And I, I want to reiterate that, again, um, the, just to summarize also, so what your actual coaching as a conscious parenting is, the, if a child, so if you've got a child and your child hurts themselves and it, you know, we are here again, it's not like they haven't been run into it by a car at 30 miles now. This is like m- more often when we think, though even it can be like when the bicycle, you know, a more serious thing, we immediately get there when we're doing this two things that I hear is common throughout, which is we're providing safety and security and support while providing the space for autonomy and leadership by the child. So in the example you gave of your son, you were immediately there. If he had badly hurt himself, for example, he was non-responsive at all. Obviously, you would have done things. Or if he was, oh, my God, I've broken my arm, I'm in such pain, or you would have taken action. But you waited for him to express if he can. And 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 even are actually silent. And I I, want to emphasize that, which is, for me, 
when I got this coaching, I noticed I had this incredible habit energy with my son to say, is it okay? I, I, I would, and I remember beginning coaching from you of going over when we, let's say gone for a small walk. He was very young at this point, just maybe one and a half and he might fall over sometimes. And, I would, and I feel it's related to our previous point. I would be, are you okay? Is it okay? And actually I'm imposing my actual worry because it's very clear in the way that I'm speaking. It's my fear and worry for him, which is very natural, but I'm like onto him. And when I notice, I just want to share here, maybe for listeners, as I start to do this and I would immediately be there, I would be right present with him, knelt down, but I wouldn't say anything and I would just be with him what was actually amazing is that he would often kind of like work out as a small child. It was more almost like there was this shock for him. And then he would be, you could kind of watch him look around, like kind of assess, like almost asking his body, like, are we okay? And often when, in fact, he'd, it was a shock, but he hadn't really hurt himself or he'd scratched himself a little bit. He would kind of just get up. I was present. And I think this is something you haven't mentioned yet. Often I would cl clean his hands. I would ask him if he wanted me to clean his hands, even if there wasn't a lot of dirt there or anything, but just as a, a symbol that I was really present and taking care of him. And then he would go off. And what was funny is he would even often not, if he wasn't actually hurt, he'd stopped kind of, he wasn't crying. He would, he would, it was more, he was, had this self-possession. And I mean, it in a positive sense, it wasn't that like he was repressing anything, but he had this kind of, and people would remark on it. Other parents would actually say to me like, wow, you know, he's, he falls over and, 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 and if he really was hurt, he would express, but if he wasn't, it was more a shock. He would just get up and people would be like, wow, you, he gets up. And I want to finish that story by saying your point about the public. I once remember that he fell over on a road near a kind of roundabout where there were quite a lot of cars. And I was with him. I was right next to him. I was sitting down, sand, kneeled down, present with him. And he wasn't even crying. It was clear that he hadn't hurt himself that badly and he was going to get up. And someone actually stopped their car and started shouting at me. Uh, and what was struck me in that moment from your coaching was a lot of compassion, actually, for the person in the car. Because what I realized, because I was also like that and had been like that, was how much suffering we're projecting and or dealing with when we see children suffer or even imagine they suffer. Um, you know, I saw people almost forcibly pick my son up in front of me in other situations like that as well, where people would intervene with my child, even though he was actually fine and wasn't even requesting that assistance. And I was right there. And that for me was also very striking about this final point, which is, that this brings up, I know in myself, but also in others, this suffering and this difficulty to be with uh, a child's upset. And I think that's the point I, I want to also emphasize. And I think you, you said it is that it touches, again, why this is such a training for conscious parenting is both for the child, but for the parent is you deal with your own anxiety and fears. I mean, I think almost every parent has well, I don't know. I don't want to speak for, I know for myself, I had a lot of deep down. I saw, you know, even about my child dying, you know, like, you know, you have a man, you know, my God, the road, the cars, you suddenly realize this an ancestral energy or energy in yourself of, of anxiety and which isn't theirs. And what I think also to finish on this is this path of parenting. If it inspires you, if you're listening is it's a real chance to really take care of your child, but, and to not transmit that, to give them actually true safety, true confidence, true security for themselves, where they really know they are looked after if something is happening, but they actually don't have all this transmission of, oh my God, are you okay? Oh, you know, let me grab you and deal, do this or that for you it lets them start to discover their own power and their ability to take care for, of themselves in a generous, well way. And which is also not like you must be a man or something, you know, it's this middle way. And I want to kind of actually just ask you a question out of that, which is there is a style of parenting um, again, which I think you also experience in some of the places, which is like kind of the total freedom. It's like, you know, you've, 
you've fallen over, you deal with it. You, 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 or, you know, you should eat whatever you want, play wherever you want. There's no bedtime. It's like, go to bed when you want. Um, you know, the whole range of, of that, but which sometimes actually does go with quite a lot of anxiety, I should emphasize, people worry, but your style isn't that style. The conscious parenting isn't that let them do whatever they want. You already mentioned that with food, but that's also true, I guess, about bedtime or even about putting other limits or like getting dressed. Can you talk a bit about that? Maybe start with some of the experiences you saw of, of the kind of like free parenting, whatever we might want to call it, that you saw at certain points. And then what your style would be, the conscious parenting style. Yeah, the, the freestyle is a little bit, it's like a little bit what happened to me. It's like an idealization of freedom, of wanting to do the opposite as you receive. It's going to an extreme also. In, of course, the middle way is what you're all, all the time kind of, kind of repeating, which I think it's a good way to describe what I've been learning all these years. It's like this middle way. Uh, it's not one side of like giving complete freedom because many times what I've seen is that the children are not balanced within themselves when they have this lack of boundaries and that the, I, what, uh, my experience in my own process and in many other families that I have been coaching is like there is no balance inside the child, there is no balance inside the house, inside the relationships. I, I remember a very extreme case of one woman that she was completely, she had a strong aversion to the word limits, okay, boundaries. He didn't want anything to do with boundaries. And she would let the children do what they wanted. But in front of me, I was spending a few days in her house. And for me, it was unbearable. Like, it was impossible to be there in peace and in harmony because the things that they were happening, many of them, they were not like things that they give you uh, joy and happiness. They, it could happen that the, the child sometimes is charged. The older child was charged, for example, and she would go to the younger child and just get the glass with milk and just pull it on the plate, on the little child's plate, because she was charged. I see that many times when we don't put boundaries, the children get really charged. And when what, they what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Just can you say? When you say charge, because it has quite, a, you, you, it's really actually an important term in your coaching. What do you mean by charge? And can you describe a child who's charged? What, yeah, what is it? That instead of uh, having an attitude of love and care and, and cooperative, it's like uh, quite tense and violent inside. Even sometimes it's even smiling, but many of the, the actions that the child takes are not actions that bring uh, harmony, love, uh, uh, balance. But for example, it's just getting things and throwing them away. Or in this case, I remember that the child went there and just took the glass with milk and just the, the other one, the, the, the sister was only a baby, so she could not talk. She just would take the, the this and put it on the plate of the baby. The baby could not say anything and I saw it. And she did it even another was watching because this is not even normal. I mean, some yeah. children are charged, but they do it when you don't see them. But she was so charged and so unbalanced that she did it no matter what, even in front of the mother. And which is, which is for me, this is not a, uh, this is not so natural that happens such a behavior because it's more natural for us that we want to be accepted, that we want to be in harmony. We act our, our in a biological level our survival depends on, on being part of the community. So like for a child to do that, it's like this child is totally out of her balance in this and case. We, and we want to just emphasize something here, because I think this is something that comes up, especially for kind of, I want to say, you know, I, I'm a bit alternative, but like alternative parenting, it's like well, there's this reaction because as you said, even the, the childhood you described at school, many people have had experiences of sort of feeling repressed in some way, or, you know, there was school and they were forced to do this, or they were forced to do that, or their parents, they felt forced them. And there's this understandable, we really want to say really understandable reaction of like giving more freedom. And as you described, actually, college parenting involves giving a lot of freedom and, and autonomy to the child, but there, and there are these limits. And so just to go back, you said you were with this mother and she, she herself had this aversion to the kind of word, even limit or boundary. And what you're saying is the consequence of that you mostly will notice with children is that they're charged. And this will happen, by the way, I would say 
whatever kind of parent you are, your child will get charged at some point because, and what you mean by this charge, you can sense it in that there's somehow a disequilibrium. And, and what's subtle about it is often the child can seem happy. Like sometimes I've seen it also in my own child or others, people are, oh, but they're, you know, they're just, they're just, they're just exuberant. And there's a difference between joy and happiness and, 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 and playing even like excitedly. And when it's kind of got to the charge, you can feel it in the sense as you're saying that, there's sort of a destructive aspect to it. There's a, an unwillingness. I noticed it with my own child, which is, yes, he's playing, but if he's well, he will listen. If I say to him, can we, okay, you know, you're, if you keep doing that, something might get broken. He will respect that. Was when he's charged, he'll just kind of keep going. So, but the case, can you just come back to the woman? So she had this aversion to boundary and limits. Yes. And, there's this, and you're saying there's this consequence actually is it's not so well. And I how... And what, so you've seen that and you've also probably been in communities where children are just allowed to kind of do whatever they want. And, and what's, what, what's, what doesn't work for you in your view about that? You're kind of saying people get charged. They're not, well, what, why does it not work as a parenting style? You think in the end for people? I, in my experience, it doesn't work because it doesn't bring harmony. It doesn't bring balance. In this case, for example, I keep going with that uh, in that, moment the child was also saying a lot of lies there was not a there was not a real like a relation of trust and sincerity with the mother and she would say oh this glass just fell okay when the mother comes the mother is really tired with the little children making the breakfast and everything and then because I was present for me it was that you must say the truth I mean I must say the truth as Esther so I said well I saw how you took the glass and you throw it on the so I only said what I saw. So in, I didn't hide what the child had done because I didn't feel that would have been very nice. And the mother somehow, oh, you shouldn't do that, but no consequences, not much screaming, no, no much problem. But what I saw after one, one day and a half, the mother was getting really tired because boundaries are actually to create a safe environment for everyone, not only for the baby, not only for the dog, for the ants, for the child, also for the mother. Boundaries are not there. And then there is like a big chaos. And the whole house was dirty, the toys everywhere. Uh, and then she was really in a moment of at night time when she was more tired, all of a sudden the nerves uh, came to her in a moment that the child was doing nothing too bad. It was a lot worse what she had did in the morning. The, the, the child hardly did nothing and all of a sudden, the mother, paf! Um, I don't know how you say it is in English. Like slap, slap the the fist with with anger. Like she was totally out of her control, which I understand because to be with a child that has no boundaries, it really like for me, it, I had to leave that house. I mean, I could not live there. It's so much shouting, so much there, so many. And for me, I love children when they they do uh, listen, when they are balanced. But when they are like that, I remember the child. One of her games was just to smash the ants, smash the ants, just kill the ants. That was one of the games. And for one moment, I was alone with this child and we were in the swimming pool and she was started to do that. And as soon as I saw it, I said, if I am present, I don't allow you to do that. And she said, this is my house. This is another thing, you know, her, her development of the, of the speaking was really like high because the mother would also give a lot of reasoning and, 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 this, and they were very happy with this child, so clever. And, and she was doing these kind of things, but I was just saying, yeah, I know this is your house, but I'm talking about the ants and I'm not gonna allow you to, to kill the ants, you know? And then she uh, wanted- Yes, you wanted to keep doing it. See, and, I, and then I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put my hand in between your hand and the hand of the ant and I'm stronger and faster. And, and then she ran away. It was maybe the first limit in many years, you know, and she ran away really like upset. And she went to speak with the mother. Oh, this girl doesn't allow me to, to do that. And the mother came to me and she said, these ants sometimes uh, bite us. So that's why we kill them. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't allow her to, to kill the ants in front of me anyway. I, I am a protector of the ants, you know, <laughs> anyway. Even I'm in their house, I don't mind. But it was quite difficult. Uh, but this from one side is like she was, the mother was completely unable to put boundaries. But at the end of the day, 
she would slap the face of the child in a moment that nothing really bad was happening. And I understood the suffering of the mother. I understood very well. And I want to say this, which is like whether that even had got to whether you could just keep tolerating it. I think the point was the child was in suffering. The child must have been, I mean, I don't know the situation, but to do that, whether it's wanting attention or whatever. And I, I want to kind of say, so one is to say there's there's this middle way. And so the, the way of conscious parenting, which is also maybe important because I see that can be confronting, is that it does involve boundaries for the child and it involves uh, enforcing them. But I also want to emphasize in a way that you just described, which is um, with, you talked about consequences, but also the way you did it. I, I think this is important. So again, for me, I can just share a story, which is you from your coaching, which was our son. Uh, this was, he was about one and a half, I guess, at this time. And he has a bath every night. And often there, but when you first came to coach it, for me, I, I was often in kind of in charge of bath time and it had turned into a bit of a circus. You know, he, he would, um, you know, he kind of got into like, oh, I don't want to take my clothes off. I'm going to run around the bathroom. And I remember the coaching, which you described also with how you dealt with this girl in the hand, which was, you said, I'm not, I, I, I would never be the case. I would, let's say, grab him and take his clothes off forcibly. No, absolutely not. That wouldn't be the case. However, I would block him. And what I would, I would, I, I, it was permissible. Uh, the way of the conscious parenting was to block him with my arms to not let him run around and and wait with him until he got present and truly wanted to cooperate with me about wanting to take his clothes off and so like there even with the girl you didn't grab her hand you and you also didn't tell her that she was bad you just simply which was which is also not true she's not bad you, you simply stopped her you were in, in intervening physically but not against her she might get upset, but you, and, and I want to bring that out. So how was particularly small or even older children, how do we create those boundaries and limits? Um, what does that actually look like? So in the case of, let's say my son, who is about to run around the bathroom rather than take, you know, I've said to him, look, it's time to take your clothes off. And he's not wanting to, he's kind of giggling. He's maybe a bit charged, who knows? How do you, how does an apparent you manage that? How, how do you act? Of course, there are different uh, different situations, but the younger the child is, the more is like the the word goes with the body. Like for example, I say, uh, and it's true that you need to be present. This is something that it's very. I keep saying because it, normally we say I do, I cannot do what Stair says because I do not have time. It's true. If you do not have time, if you cannot be present, you cannot really help a child to develop in a place of, of, uh, of from himself with a safe environment. He really needs your presence and your time. A child, a human beings need at least, at least, he needs a lot more, but at least one adult that is able to be present and to be aware of what's happening and to, and to put the boundaries. And if he's very young or she is very young, young, uh, many times you say it and you do it at the same time. So can I just make one comment here again for maybe my to myself, but also maybe to other listeners who are, you know, I had a I have a full time job. It's true that I took quite a lot of time with that yet, but I think there's one point here which is you could think of it as time, but you could also think of it, particularly in the West, in terms of investment and long termism, uh, and how much benefit you will receive as a parent if you are well now how many years of therapy or of estrangement you know how many people uh i've seen you know we and i've seen in my own life that you know we have difficulty with our parents or you know or then or that there's a lot of suffering in my in your own life from things not that it was your parents fault or responsibility but just like Wow, you know, the, the, the transformation. I think this is why this really, really relates to much deeper things about even politics or how we organize our societies and why conscious parenting goes very deep is this point is we're also talking, obviously goes on throughout your children's lives, but we're also the early years are so powerful and important. And I I noticed this point that when you you 
you rush and often there are like oh, i've got to get him to school and or i've got to get him to the crash so i can get back from my work calls you know i'm talking for myself here but that you and you, we can talk about how you do deal with those circumstances which will come up as well as possible but the overall point is we're not necessarily talking about you know something you know you've got to be with your child all of the time every day but it's the point of presence that of actually having the energy and doing having the discipline to make the effort that has these huge payoffs and now you all of them want to make a big one just for people listening before we come into it which is you do it a few times so for example with my son making the effort and it might at the beginning actually then take 45 minutes for him to get ready to get in the bath because we're going to do this whole effort and i haven't been being present but then once it's working well you have a you have a harmony you have cooperation and the cooperation isn't me imposing my will but more like he wants to have a bath he wants to take his clothes off with me and then get in the bath and do things and then it's actually a joy because I think the other thing is that people often end up as parents. I know for myself, when you're tired, you've got your work and other things, but we end up in a vicious rather than a virtuous cycle. We end up with cycle, we're tired, we don't have enough time, then we're rushing things, then the child, things are not well, and then they, it's frustrating, and then it kind of just goes round and round. And I want to really emphasize that this is also a kind of wise investment, that if you make the effort and the energy to do this, the payoff even in the near term over the next few weeks or months, but especially over the year is enormous. Um, and so I want to emphasize that when you say about presence, and I also want to say, you know, I, I, I can remember coaching from you Esther about, you know, breakfast where you were like, I was on my kind of phone. I've got my young son. I prepared his food, but I'm busy trying to deal with my WhatsApp messages. And you're like, that's not going to work. You know, it's only maybe 20 minutes, but really be present during his breakfast. You know, don't be on your phone, really be with him. And I noticed the effect later in the day, how cooperative, if I'm really present when I'm supposed to be with him, then when we come to other moments of like, okay, can we put our toys away? It's time for bed. I don't have a 20 minute fight about it. You know, I have, he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to come to bed. So let me sh maybe say a bit, you were saying the voice, you're actually saying the practice here of um building cooperation about let's say this example of he's a one and a half year old and it's we're getting ready for the bath and it's time to take the clothes off i mean just one thing to emphasize to start with one aspect of the conscious parenting you could talk to is he's going to do it with me i'm not going to just like take them off him you know here you go it's going to be a a dance together and what happens, and we can talk a bit then also what happens if he's wanting to run around or things how do we do that can you talk a bit to that yeah, since they are babies, every time we take care of their basic needs, maybe for in this example, taking out the clothes, it's a basic need, uh, taking out the clothes. We do it with love, we do it with presence, and we wait that he cooperates or she cooperates. Even a baby already uh, cooperates a lot. We have Emmy Pickler, many videos that they show how very little babies, when we tell what we're going to do, they already help, even babies. So we do understand that a human being is like that. And then bit by bit, as he grows, we do less and he does more. And sometimes we are in a hurry and he already can pull, pull his trousers down. But because we are in a hurry, we keep doing it ourselves. And then the child understands that, okay, you're so fast, you know, I don't do it. I don't have the chance to do it. And he gets into the habit that you do it. But we try to put awareness there on, okay, now we're going to take the trousers and then we wait and we see how the child starts and it's difficult and he puts effort. And if we do not interfere a lot, he will put a lot of effort. If he's charged once again, if he's out of his center because many conditions are not there for his well-being, because there are only two ways. He may be with well-being or not. When there is well-being, there is harmony, everything is flowing, it's cooperation, he gets a lot of concentration and joy doing things. And when there is suffering inside, every little thing can be unbearable. These trousers don't go out. And you know that it's not about the trousers because when the child is with enough well-being, he can spend a long time pulling down. Their, their, you know it. I've seen Ati and your little child trying to put him something in his pocket. And when he was very young and his uh, capacity to move his fingers and everything was difficult and the pocket was very, very narrow. And 
And he was there just for so long until he could do it. I think it was a glove or something. It was really hard. And he had so much patience, so much concentration, so much um, will to, to do it by himself that I was only there. And he spent like 10 minutes. Well, I think it was like little nuts. One day we went to collect little nuts and how he was crushing them and putting them into the bag. And then they were really difficult things. And he took so much time and concentration with no frustration at all. And there are other moments with a very little thing, like the trousers don't come down, we can get really frustrated. And then there, for me, my, my, my role as an adult is like to be there for that frustration more than to put the trousers down. More, much more. It's like, wow, it's so hard. These trousers don't come out. And it makes you so upset because other days they don't come out and he doesn't get so upset. He keeps pushing or he comes and asks for help but it doesn't get so overwhelmed by that. So if he gets overwhelmed, we need to understand that the bath is not so important. It's more important that now I am with him with this uh, suffering, with this frustration, listening. And then as you say, when he's really like balanced, he comes and he just takes the clothes very happy and he goes into the bath and it's like one minute. That's why you say it's really worth, worth it to invest time to give them what they need, which is our presence, a right environment. This we can keep uh, doing more interviews to understand. Every human being should have the question, what do they need? What does our children need to feel well and to feel like that they can uh, expand their potential so that, that we will make them really happy to, to feel that they are growing from within and reaching new new. Uh, things that they can learn by themselves and they become so excited and enthusiastic and they can be hours and hours doing those things. How, how do we reach this point? Why our children are bored and why are they charged? Why is everything so difficult? Why do are, are they so addicted to things like food, mobiles and these things like that? Because we still don't understand what are the conditions for them, for their well-being. So we should really like act ask this to ourselves and put it to practice. So in this case, uh, when the child is not corroborating, that's why I do stop him. Yeah, he wants to run away. And then I say, no, now I'm not playing. I kind of stop him a little bit. I maybe put the ball away and maybe, because it's also important to, uh, uh, if we have a rhythm and we say to him like, look, now uh, uh, in 10 minutes or in a little bit, or when it gets dark, if it's something concrete, the better for a, for a younger child or after snack time or when we go in the house, something really concrete, then after we're gonna go to the bathroom. So he knows it and he can prepare it. And it doesn't matter if in one moment he's not yet ready and we say, okay, I will wait five more minutes. It's okay to be a little bit flexible. We don't need to be like straight away right now because I say it, but it's true that we're gonna do it. And now if he's charged and he starts running around when the time has come, even we have already said it and said it well, and he has seen already us putting up the, the things in the bathroom. And we say to him, look, I'm already putting the towel in the bathroom. So we always try to put like concrete examples of what we are saying. So he can, can get into the idea in a clear way, understand us. And then, uh, and then I would stop him if he starts running around the house because I really feel, okay, now I don't want to play. Now I really want to do this. Maybe it's also late and I, I need to do it early enough so I am with enough energy. And how would you stop them? So just to say, just to say, so one example would be I grab the child, I take them into the bathroom. That isn't, that isn't the constant par conscious parenting rate, right? How, how would I stop a child that's running around how do you do that in a kind of loving and firm way? What's just, just practically? Practically, like, for example, I would, I would do two or three steps in front of him and go in front of him and maybe hold him in a very wide way, for example, and try to look at him and say, wow, I see now you, are, you, want, to, you want to play, but I, I really don't want to play and speak really from our hearts. Boundaries can be really the voice of our heart. When I really say to my wow, I see you now, you are enjoying so much with your friends jumping on the sofa. But for me, really, I don't feel it right. I don't feel, I don't feel good, it's too much noise for me. So boundaries are also like a way to speak, what do I need? And sometimes right. I need the same, I need to put boundaries on myself. I would love to 
scream to my child because I'm nervous and I'm getting like overwhelmed. But I need to say to myself, this is not what I want to do. So I need to breathe and I need to find other ways. So boundaries are always also, not always, but they can also be a way to protect myself and others. It can be like the, the earth. The earth is very solid. We cannot dive in the earth. We cannot just go like in the water in the earth. But thanks to that, we can walk. We wouldn't be able to walk if the earth was not solid. And, mm -hmm. and that's how boundaries can help us to do things that without boundaries we wouldn't. But it's true that we need to understand what are the boundaries that help and what are the boundaries that do not help, what, which more, most of them were in our childhood. And that's why now we don't want any boundaries because we believe that all of them are like self-destroying, self-denying. And it's not like that. Many boundaries are a really true need for harmony, peace at home, true understanding of each other. And for and the child. And for the child to be well and grow and feel safe. Yeah. So, because I think that's to finish. I remember one of the vivid stories you had was seeing being in a community, a communal living project with a lot of freedom for the children. But what that actually meant was many children weren't safe because the older children or different children could do whatever. There wasn't actually true safety. And even for a child on its own, that's true. I want to pause today. I want to bring it. And I think there's a couple of things just as, as a signpost for people tuning into the next episode about it is one is around deep cleaning. What happens if I like block, like, like I stop the child and say, I want you, you know, I need, you know, I have a need that, you know, you're shouting or it's time for a bath. And they're like, no, and it, it's a bit more like the apple. I think that question of how we, we do deep cleaning is important. And I think maybe also the other is to explore a bit more the actual, this philosophy of like, what is it? Because all of these things around, first of all, how do we, how do we make judgments about well boundaries versus not ones? And you talked about actually true needs and being in touch with ourselves. But also that kind of judgment is like there's a connection of the conscious parenting to sort of our wisdom and how do we cultivate that in ourselves and then for our children um, that I think is really, uh, you know, leads the principles and leads into this principle of behind it, what we think we're trying to support in the development in a child. You've talked about their their singular nature, their, their individual genius, their, their capacity to discover for themselves, their autonomy, but also how this boundary, this safety. So I think there's a couple of things for next time. And I really want to say thank you, Esther, for, for this session. I look forward to the next one. And uh, thanks to all our listeners uh, for today.